You're live. Okay. Good evening. Uh, welcome to the uh, special meeting of the McDowell Snorn Preserve Commission. Uh, I'm Steve Dodd, chairperson of the committee of the commission and calling the meeting to order. Uh, we will begin with a roll call. Uh, Vice Chair Cynthia Winstrom. We're not hearing you, Cynthia. Cynthia Winstrom is here. Okay, uh, Commissioner Mark Hackbarth. I'm not showing Commissioner Hackbarth okay. on that. We'll move to Commissioner Laura LaPat Pulasco. Commissioner LaPat Pulasco is here. Uh, Commissioner Marsha Lips. Commissioner Marsha Lips is here. Uh, Commissioner Jace McKeegan. Commissioner McKeegan is here. And Commissioner Tawana Parker. Commissioner Parker here. Great, thank you. Uh, <clears throat> we have no public comments we've received uh, uh, for tonight. Uh, as you know, we're doing this uh, electronically uh, and have been doing that for several months and we'll continue to do that for the foreseeable future. We do, us, we, we do accept uh, written uh, comments from the public though. We just don't have any uh, for tonight's meeting. So with that, uh, we will move on to the uh, approval of our minutes. Uh, this is a meeting from our November 5th uh, regular meeting. Uh, commissioners, uh, are there any questions or comments on the uh, minutes from the November 5th meeting? Okay, I hear no questions or comments from the uh, commissioners uh, regarding the minutes. Uh, is there a motion to approve the minutes from the November 5th meeting? This is Vice Chair Winstrom. I'll make a move to accept the minutes as presented. Okay, thank you. Right Who is, the, uh, we have a second? I second, Marsha Lips. Oh, Commissioner Lips, second. Uh, and we'll do a roll call vote. Uh, uh, Commissioner, uh, Commission Chairperson Dodd says yes. Uh, Commissioner Cynthia Winstrom says yes. Uh, Commissioner Hackbarth. Uh, Commissioner Lapat Pulasco. Commissioner Lapat Pulasco says yes. Uh, Commissioner Lips. Commissioner Lips says yes. Uh, Commissioner McKeegan. Yes. And Commissioner Tawana Parker. Yes. Yes, okay, we have approval uh, of the minutes from the November 5th meeting. Uh, we'll move to item five on our agenda. And I think we may be juggling a bit here. Uh, you are correct. Um, item 5A, we are going to slide behind uh, 5B. Um, and so we will start with that and just a uh, a quick reminder that the um, these items on the item five are all related to uh, the preserve policy reviews that uh, we've been working on for the um, uh, next 25 years of preserve management. And um, so um, right now, Tiffany is uh, doing a presentation um, and will be joining us soon. So we're gonna move forward to item 5B. Did you introduce yourself? Oh, this is Corey Ackfaw. I'm sorry. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Um, my apologies for that. Uh, I'm the preserve director for the city of Scottsdale. And um, so specific to uh, item 5B, uh, we're going to be uh, just reviewing the uh, preserve tax status and uh, uh, kind of re-reviewing future funding options that I think we last looked at about eight months ago. And we, have, <clears throat> excuse me, we have with us tonight, Gina Kirkland, who is uh, the city's enterprise and finance director. And Gina's um, gonna be taking us through some slides and both myself and Commissioner McKeegan will be adding some commentary as we go through this on this item. 
so with that, Gina, uh, feel free to uh, begin. Scott will advance slides for you. Good evening. Um, I visit you about annually to give you uh, an update on the Preserve fi Fund financial updates. And Scott, if you'll forward one slide. Um, so, um, and one more, please. So I am here to talk to you about the Preserve sales tax cash flow assumptions um, before we actually get into the cash flow numbers. Um, we'll go over just a couple of assumptions that we included in the cash flow, starting out with the fiscal 21 through 25, which is our five year planning period, are equal to the adopted financial plans um, adopted by city council. Uh, the fiscal 21 sales tax forecasts were decreased by nearly 10% um, as we knew as we were finishing the fiscal 21 budget, COVID was just starting to be an issue. Um, therefore, the fiscal 21 budgets were adjusted and that's why it was decreased by nearly 10% um, mirroring the fiscal 18 uh, actual revenue collection. So we basically reset the bar back several years to that similar revenue collection. Fiscal 22 through 25 are increasing by an average of 5% reflecting a strong recovery. So um, we anticipated a strong recovery and we hope that that will occur. Um, by fiscal 25, the end of that five year planning period, the forecast returns the sales tax collections to 11% over the current or the most recent fiscal year. So again, we're resetting that bar and then we're growing pretty strongly um, through the year two through four. The remaining years outside that five year period, 26 to 34, sales tax are forecasted to increase by 1.5% annually, which is actually pretty modest. Next slide. To continue with some assumptions, fiscal 21 through 25 interest income forecasts are also equal to the adopted five-year financial plan. Interest income forecasts are increasing by an average of 3% for the planning period, which in today's market is very aggressive and not going to be seen. Outside of that fiscal, that five-year planning period, fiscal years 26 through 24 are increasing at 1.5% annually which is probably closer to reality. Next slide, please. The preserved land improvements, so the, now we've moved on to the expense side, are forecast to be 2 million annually with the exception <clears throat> of fiscal 21. Land improvements are actually forecasted at 7 million for fiscal 21. Debt service is scheduled to be paid off in 2034 um, and this, forecast that we're reviewing tonight assumes no refunding opportunities or new issuances. Now, technically speaking, we are looking at some refunding opportunities right now, um, but those conditions continue to change day by day. And perhaps once the refundings are done and we know what kind of savings we've achieved, maybe I can come back to the preserve and give you an update. Sales tax forecasts assume no change in taxable commodities such as phasing out food or elimination of rental tax. The cash flows have not been present value discounted and also the city treasurer's office, although we've prepared this as of this month, all forecasts are subject to change. Next slide, please. So getting into the numbers, this is a 14 year forecast for 21 through 34. Uh, the first tranche of sales tax, the 0.2%, we are forecasting um, just shy of $122 million of revenue. And the second tranche of sales tax, the 0.15%, forecasting just over $287 million. Interest income, which might be a little bit aggressive, is just shy of $6 million. So our total sources, $415 million. Um, just over 415 million. The uses or the expenditures, land improvements are forecasted to be 33 million. Uh, we do have professional services um, such as audits on an annual basis, 
forecasted to be 40 million. Debt service, just over 351 million. And then some fiscal agent fees, which are fees that we pay to our banks, um, 210,000. The total uses are forecasted at just over 385 million. Next slide, please. So if you pull all of this together, our beginning fund balance is approximately $35 million. Add in our sources, subtract our uses. We're forecasting just shy of 65 million at the end of fiscal year 34. Uh, I Gina, went through that pretty quickly. Are there any questions? Yeah, Gina, why don't we, uh, we'll back the slide up one and let's just see if there's any uh, questions about that. Let's I'll tell you what, let's back it up one more. I just want to add up uh, one, one comment there. Um, under the uses and expenditures, where Gina identified the, the land improvements um, at 33 million, um, and her previous slide had showed that that was um, uh, $7 million in this current uh, fiscal year, and that's covering Pima Dynamite Trailhead. And then um, she allocated um, upwards of $2 million a year uh, in subsequent years. And, um, and, and so that can cover a number of things. And we will be getting into those in more detail as we talk about trail, trailhead, and land acquisition improvements. So we use that as a placeholder. One of the big items that could be in that $33 million is uh, the land bridge, uh, the connection over uh, Pima uh, or over Dynamite uh, Rio Verde Road. Um, I'm not saying we have to do that, but we did get direction from the commission several years ago to make sure that we keep that as a placeholder and have that uh, and not lose track of that. So some, you know, as Gene is explaining, these are very fluid numbers and uh, are intended to give us a, uh, a sense of where we stand and where we think we're going. Uh, but as sales tax revenue changes, uh, recoveries, uh, how strong they are, et cetera, this is a dynamic and we'll, we'll always uh, be updating you on that. Uh, I do have a, a note that uh, Commissioner McKeegan would like to make a comment as well. Yes. Uh Thanks, Corey. This is Commissioner McKeegan. And I, I, yeah, I wanted to, first of all, I was going to reiterate exactly what you just said, that these are obviously, obviously highly variable. As, as Gina said, they're projections. Um, we've seen what can happen in as little as six months um, that uh, single events can have significant impacts on these numbers. So we always need to keep that in mind that these really are floating out there and they're the they're the best tool we have right now, but they're, they're our best guesses. Um, Gina, I had one comment slash question slash clarification for you, and that is um, on that land improvement forecast, um, though we're, we're talking about running those improvements and that basically that $2 million num dollar number, except for the seven that Croy just mentioned, we're talking about running those from 2021 through right through 2034, is that right? Yes, actually 22 through 34, yes. Okay, great. Mm -hmm. And um, you sort of generally referred to this earlier when you, when you talked about the debt service, and actually it's on the slide that's in front of us. Mm -hmm. But um, we take that roughly $64 million number. If we are looking at something like land acquisition, what effect does the financing have generally on what's available to purchase? I'm assuming that it would not be the full, let's just make it a round number. Let's say it's 60 million. I'm assuming we're, we're not close to having $60 million available for purchase because there's going to be a fairly significant chunk that goes into financing that. That's absolutely correct. Yes. Um, um, and, and I hate to throw out any ballparks of interest rates anymore because the market changes so dramatically and how long we're going to um how long it takes to come out of this covid situation really does impact what you're looking at for debt service if it takes the united states another year to um, a full economy um, we might have interest rates similar to today um, and that's closer to to 
2%, 3%. However, given two years, a strong recovery, we could be right back up to what we are used to, which is about three and a half, four percent 4%. So that's double the interest. Um, I think a wise benchmark would be to use um, for whatever principal balance you're thinking about issuing, add 7%. And I think that's a good benchmark to use to determine what you can afford. So if you're looking at $60 million, um, perhaps uh, a benchmark of $40 million um, is more wise, or you, I'm sorry, $20 million is probably more what you can afford in, uh, in a principal balance. Um, it's hard to, to give you tools to use in today's market. However, we have tools uh, such as external financial planners that can help us through these evaluations. If there was uh, principal balances that you wanted to look at whether or not the preserve could afford it with the current sales tax, we can absolutely run those numbers um, at any point. But the bottom line is whether it's the commission or the council or the public who's looking at land acquisition, if, if land acquisition is the issue, that, that's one point at which these numbers are, are significantly reduced just based upon what's on the financing required. Whereas if you're looking at improvements over several years, it's more of a fixed cost that, that could be as pay as you go. But the, the acceleration of a big purchase requires the financing. And so, Absolutely. Yes. Okay. Thank you very much. Appreciate thank it. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Chair, if I could just uh, note right now, uh, Commissioner Hackbarth has uh, joined us electronically and just wanted to check, uh, Commissioner Hackbarth, if you can uh, uh, give us a quick uh, confirmation that you can hear us and we can hear you. I got gotcha. you. Okay. Thank you, Commissioner Hackbarth <clears throat> and Commissioner McKeegan. Uh, any other questions or comments uh, from commissioners on this presentation? And Gina does have another slide uh, at, okay. if we're done with the uh, uh, projection on the, the tax cash flow, uh, we've got another slide on future funding options. Okay. As a reminder. Uh, Gina, back to you. So in our last annual meeting, when we were looking at the financial update, we had talked about funding options. And this is really just to remind um, the commission of what we talked about. Um, the commission decided not to move forward with any of these items at this time, um, but ideas that we discussed last year included extending the existing preserve sales tax, establishing a new preserve sales tax, um, establishing a special taxing district, and then a number of fees like entrance, parking, or perhaps other fees. We also discussed naming rights, adopting a trail or sponsorships, nonprofit fundraising, and finally trusts. Um, the concerns that were raised at that time about these ideas um, were, there were several, um, for example, Extending or creating a new sales tax would require voter approval. Um, if we were to look at a special taxing district, there are none in, in place at this time. So the formation costs would be significant. And also you're looking at um, property or owner approval, such as voter approval again. Um, when we talk about fees, entrance and parking fees, um, as well as other fees, we might have some resistance from citizens or residents. Um, also, when you talk about fees, it's best to have a strategy where your fee and your benefit have this nexus. And if your fee doesn't relate to the preserve directly, it would be a difficult conversation um, in order to put that in place. Um, naming rights or adopt a trail or sponsorship, it's potentially a one-time funding source and, and also unreliable. Also, uh, trust would require a sizable upfront amount. So there were a number of concerns about these ideas um, and to date, um, they're still just ideas and, and up for consideration. 
And Mr. Chairman, Mr. Croy, I would just add that as we go through this uh, policy review process, uh, our intent is to come up with both an understanding of what yearly costs might be for the variety of maintenance or uh, um, uh, invasive plant removals or other aspects, and then also uh, what one-time costs might be, and whether that's land acquisition or other infrastructure improvements, uh, you know, to trailheads or things like that. Uh, and once we have that estimate that we're uh, be developing here uh, after the first of the year, um, that would then be the time that we would come back and revisit these options and having a sense of what those, uh, be it yearly or one-time costs would be, we could then uh, match that up to some of these options and see if any of them make more sense or not. Okay, great. Thank you, Croy. Um, any other questions or comments uh, from commissioners on the uh, <clears throat> on Gina's presentation, Gina and Croy's presentation? If not, we'll move on to where are we going next? Uh, Tiffany has been able to join us. Okay, good. And so I think we are prepared to uh, go back to item 5A on your agenda, the preserve habitat. I think Scott's going to take Chairman Dodd, this is Commissioner Winstrom. Can I ask one other question? I'm sorry, I was, uh, I'm, for some reason, my audio is not working very well. No, um, no, please go ahead. Thank you. So, uh, Gina, you offered the opportunity to have uh, a financial person give us projections. And I realize that this is just an information and discussion item, but I would really like to see that as something critical that we look at in the future. Is that something that's done internally or are we going to an external ex expert for that? Um, it is something that we can do internally with a review of an external. Um, Piper Jaffrey is our um, financial advisor. Mm -hmm. So we do this in, in conjunction with each other. Um, I would just need direction on the principal amount and, um, um, and I'm assuming that um, the term would be between current day and 2034 when the current taxes expire. Um, if Correct. any of that were to change, I just need those parameters and we can certainly give you some insight. Terrific. Thank you for that. Right. Thank you. Okay. Uh, if, if I could, uh, Gina, about how long does it take to prepare that? If we were to say we were interested in, say, a $40 million land purchase or something, uh, how much time would we need to get an estimate back from that review process? I think the treasurer's office could probably turn that around in a matter of days. Okay. All right. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. We're going to Scott. Yes. Uh, Mr. Chairman, commissioners, this is Scott Hamilton. I'm going to do a very brief intro for item 5A, which is uh, going to be a presentation from Tiffany Sprague on Preserve Habitat Connectivity. Uh, this is another installment of our um, review of, of policies and various items for the next 25 years of the Preserve. Uh, in our prior meetings, Tiffany gave us very informative and detailed presentations on invasive plant management in the Preserve, on our uh, restoration study and planning, Last meeting, uh, we talked about the long-term monitoring in uh, Tiffany's presentation. And tonight, she is going to discuss uh, the importance of habitat connectivity and how it relates to the preserve. So with that, I will turn it over to Tiffany and I will stop sharing the screen so she can start sharing the screen. Excellent, can everybody hear me? We can. Okay. Wonderful. Well, I apologize for being late, um, but I'm glad that this is working out. Okay, can folks see my screen? We sure can, it yes. looks great. Fabulous. All right, well, Chairman Dodd, Commissioners, thank you again for having me here tonight. I am thrilled to be here to continue uh, in our series of a whirlwind tour of the work that we do. Tonight is the last installment on this work and it's focused on habitat connectivity projects. But before we dive into that, I just wanted to take a quick step back into the presentation at the last meeting where we discussed a lot about ecosystems. And I just wanna refresh you um, and 
tee this off by saying ecosystems are essential for all life on earth and having healthy functioning ecosystems is what allows life to exist on this earth. Those ecosystems are very complex, made up of a lot of different components, species, um, and abiotic factors, and a number of interactions between those. And it's these interactions and these individual components that are really vital to maintain in order to have healthy functioning ecosystem. But unfortunately, we are seeing a decline in many of those systems. And one of those areas is in the species that occur within them. And you'll probably remember this graphic from last time showing some of the main causes for the loss of species and chief among those is habitat degradation. And this includes habitat loss, which is actually losing habitat available for species to use. Habitat degradation, which is taking quality habitat and making it less useful for species, even if it still exists. And habitat fragmentation, which is chopping up uh, areas into smaller pieces so that animals are not able to move across the landscape. And it's this last piece that we're going to focus on tonight. And so to sum it up in just one slide, connectivity is important. These large contiguous landscapes are essential for wildlife to be able to thrive on the landscape. So to put it very simply, we have a connected habitat over here on the left, and we have a fragmented habitat over here on the right, this larger piece that was chopped up into smaller blocks. And so to put it very simply, connected habitat is good, whereas fragmented habitat is not so good from a biological perspective. And the reason for that is very diverse, but generally speaking, and there's a number of studies that show this, the larger a land area is, the more contiguous and connected it is, the more species that you're going to have in it. Whereas when you begin to chop that up into smaller pieces, over here on the right-hand side, even if all of these individual blocks add up to the same amount of area as this large connected landscape on the left-hand side, we will still have vastly fewer species in each of these individual blocks than we will have in that larger connected landscape. And the reasons for that, simply put, wildlife need room to roam. They need to be able to move freely about the landscape in order to access the resources that they need on daily levels, seasonal levels, interannual levels, and more. They need to be able to move, they need to be able to migrate, they also need to be able to share some love out there. Uh, so. Genetic loss is one of the primary causes for species decline, and genetic diversity is essential for populations of species to survive into the future. But we as people have a way of kind of interfering with this, and as we come in and we build our infrastructure, whether that's residential communities, industrial, transportation infrastructure, mining, agricultural areas, and whatever, we have a way of taking these large segments and moving them into smaller little pieces. And by doing that, we can affect the distribution and the persistence of wildlife populations on the landscape. So to sum up the anthropogenic impacts in three different ways. So one of the most uh, prevalent issues is direct effects. So this is mortality that is caused by people. This could be intentional, if you think of somebody who finds a rattlesnake in their backyard and intentionally kills it, or it could be unintentional, such as roadkill that occurs on way too many of our roads. We also have the habitat loss that we already discussed, where we are taking this habitat and making it no longer available for species to use. And then we also have this often overlooked part, which is the habitat fragmentation piece. All right, so with that background, let's now boil down into the preserve. So we discussed last time why the preserve is important from a biological standpoint, and I want to dive into that just a little bit further now. So first of all, the location of the preserve is vital. So this map that you see here on the right shows this regional context of where the preserve sits within this large landscape. And where this preserve sits allows for nearly 3 million acres of connected habitat. So on this map, this peach area is Tonto National Forest, green is the preserve, this purple segment over here is McDowell Mountain Regional Park. We have Fountain Hills Preserve down here. And then we also have some discontiguous areas throughout the rest of the valley. But this large contiguous landscape is what allows us to have so many species. And the preserve is very vitally situated so that it is forming the connection between Tonto National Forest and the Regional Park and Fountain Hills Preserve. And all of that kind of hinges on this little gooseneck corridor right in here. Now, when we're looking at this map, I do want to point out that we do have these other protected areas. But if you look at the species lists for these areas, they don't even come close to what we have here in the preserve. And that is because they are these small, discontinuous, isolated areas that are no longer connected to the larger landscape. 
So species that require a lot of space, such as mule deer, have actually been completely extirpated from these other areas throughout the valley. Unfortunately, this connection that we have in the preserve is under threat. Uh, one of those is due to development and urbanization that is occurring around the preserve. So this map here on the right, each of these little black dots is a different structure occurring around the preserve. And these shaded areas are areas that are currently being developed or will be developed in the near future. Similarly, we have these roads that cut through that corridor area. So Rio Verde Drive and 128th Street occur right through that corridor. And then finally, there's a whole slew of other potential pressures that combined together could affect the connectivity within the preserve. Everything from natural causes such as precipitation and weather events to urban issues and human caused issues such as recreation, climate change, non-native species and more. So with that background, we can start to discuss a little bit about what we do. So we are interested in understanding how the preserve is functioning as a connector between this large landscape. And we're interested in make sure that, making sure that we can maintain that into the long term. And so all of the projects that I've discussed to date really factor into this connectivity piece. I mean, all of these projects are part of this big picture maintaining the ecosystem function. But the projects I'm going to discuss tonight are very specifically focused on the habitat connectivity piece. And so we can start with wildlife cameras. Many of you are likely familiar with this project and have seen some of the pictures from it. We'll see a lot more tonight. Uh, but with this, we are interested in assessing primarily mid to large size mammals because they are the ones most easily detected by these wildlife cameras. And we're interested in determining their distribution across the landscape and how that changes over time. And so over the last four years, we've had a slew of cameras deployed throughout the preserve. And if you look at this map on the right hand side, you can kind of make out these stars. This is just one phase of the project that we had, but you'll notice that they're not just here in the corridor area. Instead, we're interested in looking at the larger corridor, which stretches all the way from Tonto National Forest down into that connection with McDowell Mountain Regional Park. So just to share a little bit of delight with you, I wanted to show you examples of some of the amazing pictures that we get and some of the amazing critters that occupy the preserve, starting with mule deer, of course, and this was my title slide. This one is actually my all-time favorite picture that we have ever gotten with our wildlife cameras, and I'll zoom in on that so you can see why, but I think this really sums up the parental and child relationship with a totally stressed out mom and a baby who's just willing to play and do anything at once. We have animals who like to smile for the camera. We have ones that like to show off their hunting prowess. And then we're also delighted that we have species such as mountain lion. And being able to detect these rare species that require really large open areas or connected areas means that connectivity is being maintained within the preserve. So just to summarize this, uh, over the last four years, we have detected 15 different mid to large sized mammals within the preserve. And we're still undergoing a lot of analyses with this, um, but just reporting on some preliminary results, we have seen a similar number of species between the north area, so the area north of Rio Verde Drive, and the south, so the entire area south of Rio Verde Drive. <clears throat> There's only one species that was only detected in the northern area that was not detected in the south, and that's the hooded skunk, the species that you see here. So what does this ultimately mean in terms of connectivity? Well, it means so far, so good. But honestly, with many of these species, because of their generation time, it would take quite a while before we would notice that we have declines in those species or that they stop occurring within a certain area. And so continuation of projects such as this, and again, the long-term monitoring is really crucial to understand if this connectivity remains intact and if we need to step in in order to mitigate this issue. So moving on from that into this acoustic monitoring project, with this, we were interested in, in determining how sound moves across the landscape and what effects that might have on wildlife species. And so for this, in conjunction with 12 of those cameras that we had out in the preserve, we put out these acoustic monitors. And you can actually see this is one of our camera boxes and that acoustic device is stuck right in the back of that camera box. And we have tens of thousands of hours of recordings from this, so it's still being processed and then analyzed. But our partners at ASU did take a three month block of time and one recorder so that they could assess aircraft events. 
And so just from this three month block of time and just one recorder out there in the preserve, we had 2000 aircraft events. Um, we had over a hundred in a single day. And so there's a lot of activity going on out there, a lot of urban noise that is occurring within the preserve. And so if we look at what that might mean from a wildlife perspective, because decibels is, are on a logarithmic scale, um, this increase in the preserve aircraft noise actually equates to a 10,000 time increase in the sound intensity between the preserve night, which is a nice quiet area, and when an aircraft flies over. And so looking at other studies that have been done, this indicates that this definitely could influence what the wildlife are doing in the preserve, and it could affect their ability to move across the landscape. It can mask their ability to communicate with each other, it can disrupt their behaviors, and it could actually cause them to not use certain areas within the preserve. So the last project that I wanna discuss is our mule deer telemetry. Um, a couple years ago, our partner presented to the commission, and so some of you might be familiar with this project, but I'm going to give a quick summary of it here. So the goal of this was to determine what mule deer are doing in the preserve in the surrounding areas and how they're moving about the landscape. And so we put GPS collars, uh, telemetry collars on 38 deer over a two-year time period, and those GPS collars took a location every three hours. And what that equates to is a whole lot of data. So over those two years, we got more than 167,000 locations. And this map on the right-hand side, each different color is a different animal, and each of those dots is a different location. So there's more than 167,000 locations on that map. From that, we can kind of break it up and look at some different things. So first of all, we can look at males on the left and females on the right. And something you're going to notice right away is that during that two year stretch, not a single female transmitter deer crossed Rio Verde Drive, whereas we did have some males that did cross. And we can go ahead and look at those males. We had three males who crossed in the corridor here in uh, the preserve. We had one male who might have crossed over here on the left hand side. Um, just outside of the preserve, but that point is so close to the roadway that he actually could have approached it and then turned right back around without crossing. And then we had another male who crossed to the east of the preserve, crossing back and forth between the regional park and the Verde River. From all of those locations, we can also look at kind of use areas where the deer were using different spots. And so these areas in red mean that they were highly used by the deer whereas areas in the yellow mean that they were not used by the deer so much. And green means that they weren't used at all or very, very little by the deer. And if we zoom in on that corridor area, what you're going to notice is that there's actually very little use by the deer in this area in the narrowest pinch point of that corridor, whereas there is a lot of use in areas that are currently being developed. And then the final piece of this was to determine how recreation might be influencing what the deer are doing. And so what we found was that more than 95% of the preserve is within one kilometer of a trail. So on this map, any area in light blue, those are the areas that are more than a kilometer away from a trail. Areas that are red are the closest and orange are the second closest. And so those represent areas within 200 meters of the trail and that's more than half of the preserve. And we did some analysis on this. What we found was that the deer were actually avoiding the trails during the daytime when the preserve was open. They were using these much less than expected. But what was interesting was that when the preserve closed at night, deer actually came in and they used these trail areas much more frequently than expected. So to summarize all of this, the good news is that we do have a really robust mammalian community out there in the preserve. And so far, connectivity seems to be doing okay. But we are finding that urbanization and human influences such as recreation can potentially affect this and they could influence the connectivity over time. And so with that in mind, proactive mitigation and getting out there and getting ahead of this is really advisable. And so some ideas on how to go about doing that. Uh, we've been in discussions with the city. We've talked about them a little bit about doing some trail mitigation in the Gooseneck Corridor. So there's a whole slew of trails out there, uh, both official and social trails, and potentially by cleaning some of these up, um, clearing out some of that middle area, maybe it would allow deer and other animals to move more freely through this very narrow pinch point. I'm sure all of you are familiar with the idea of a crossing structure over Rio, over Rio Verde Drive, and this is something that is supported by the city and others. This uh, photo that I have here is from just north of Tucson, 
uh, over State Route 77. And this is a overpass that went in several years ago and it has been wildly successful. And then the last part of this is working with communities, working with local neighborhoods and working with people to ensure that we can keep open spaces and provide wildlife friendly uh, practices out there so that people or so that wildlife are able to move more freely through these landscapes, even if they are developed. Last thing that I wanted to mention is that coming soon, we do have two new projects that we'll be starting within the next year related to this connectivity work. We will be starting a desert tortoise telemetry project, which kind of mimics what we did with mule deer. And then we'll also be starting some bat acoustic monitoring throughout the preserve. But where do we actually go from here? Well, I think one step is definitely continuing the work that we're doing, especially with the wildlife cameras, because again, that's one of those long-term monitoring pieces where it's only over time that we're going to be able to assess these trends and determine if there's something that needs to be done in addition to what we are doing. But we also should come back and redo the mule deer telemetry study in another eight to 10 years or so, as the urbanization continues to fill in around the preserve, coming back and seeing how that is affecting what's happening with the deer would be really important information. But there's also a number of other species out there that we could do that with as well. And so I look forward to coming back at some point, discussing a little bit of that information with you. Uh, but for now, as these pictures scroll through, I would be happy to answer any questions. Uh, Commissioner McKeegan. Uh, great. Uh, Tiffany, thank you uh, again for the information as well as the great uh, graphics as well. Uh, <clears throat> we uh, will have some questions, comments from the commissioners. Uh, I think, uh, Commissioner McKeegan, your hand is up. Thank you, Chairman. Um, Tiffany, again, thank you so much. Uh, fantastic presentation. Um, as, as I've said before, um, I love the data. I think it's so important that we're collecting it, and I think it's so important that we're using it. Um, I, I have a question for you, and you touched on it um, when you looked at the, at the deer study and the trails being within, um, the basically everywhere in, in the preserve being within a kilometer of the trails. Um, through the, the trail design process, we often got comments or questions about fragmentation within the preserve by the trails. Um, and your the study is the mule deer suggests that the use probably is more important than the actual presence of the trail itself. Um, is is that a fair statement, or do we limit that to mule deer? Well, I think that we have to limit that to mule deer at this time because that's the information that we have. And so one of our ideas is to come back and do similar sorts of studies with other species, such as with the desert tortoise, such as with javelina, um, gray foxes, mountain lions, whatever we could get would be amazing information to have. Um, in terms of that actual fragmentation, it is quite possible that it is fragmenting the habitat and our partner at Game and Fish and the Conservancy have been I've had some discussions with the city about ways that we could mitigate that um, and ways that we could design trails in the future as additional trails go in, uh, ways that we can help mitigate any kind of fragmentation that occurs. And so when we're in the process of, you know, the, the trail planning process, which, you know, is the bulk of it has been done. And, and, I, and I would add that, that we've talked about this a bunch of times, but particularly in the Northern area, that that section was extremely fragmented from a lot of unauthorized use over the years. And the, the trails that are there now are actually far less than what was there, but we still have a lot. Um, but, but when that planning process goes through at the Conservancy, you are, um, are you one who reviews that and it comments on that? The Conservancy definitely will. Um, review and comment, and we're happy to provide as much information as we can. And I know that other stakeholders are also involved in that, or at least I encourage them to be, such as our partners at Game of Fish and other folks who know this issue. Okay, great. Again, thank you very much. I really appreciate the, inform the information. Thank you. Dad, this is Commissioner LaPat. I have a question. Yes, go ahead. 
Um, Tiffany, like everyone else says, great presentation. I'm just curious if the number of cameras you have out in the preserve and their locations are based on some type of statistical or this is the areas we want to cover or how you establish that. And if you had more cameras out there, would we have a better understanding of the connectivity or the amount we have out there is appropriate? That is a fantastic question. Um, so in terms of your first question, in terms of placement, yes, they are very strategically placed. And it really depends on individual research questions that we're hoping to answer. So for the first few phases of this project, we were hoping to look at the influences of the road itself on Rio Verde Drive on species occurrence and distribution. Um, and so for that, we placed all of the cameras and washes at similar elevation, um, trying to keep habitats pretty similar across it. Uh, for more recent projects, we're more interested in the long-term monitoring aspect of it. And so we're sampling additional habitat type. We're also interested in looking at influences of development. Um, and so we're placing some cameras near, near areas that are undergoing development, near more natural areas, as well as near areas that have been developed for quite a bit of time. So hopefully that answers your first question, but let me know if you have additional questions on that. And then in terms of your second one, yes, number of cameras definitely makes a difference. And if we could have hundreds of cameras out there, then we would be getting a lot more robust data set. Um, but feasibly speaking, that isn't going to work. Um, just in terms of the number of hours that it takes to maintain those cameras and process the images, as well as the cost of the cameras themselves. Uh, so just to give you an example, over this past year, we collect more than a million pictures that we are still working on profit. Thank you. Understood. Chairman Dodd, this is Commissioner Winstrom. I have a question for Tiffany. Yes, go ahead. Uh, thank you. Hello, Tiffany. Of course, as always, you know, I've praised you many times for your reporting. Thank you very much. Um, what is the knowledge that we have, the data, that shows, you showed there on your map that basically the mule deer that stay in the northern part stay there and the, those that are south of the gooseneck stay there. Does that impact the population as far as should there be more cross-pollination between those herds and or is that not critical? Chairman Dodd, Commissioner Winscom, another very excellent question. Um, so the fact that we have a lot of mule deer that are using the Northern Preserve is very much due to that connection with Tonto National Forest and the larger landscape. We do have at least five animals who moved across the roadway during this two year time frame. And it's important to note that those are five out of 38 individuals that we had. So it is not only five individuals out of the full population. However, with that said, at this point in time, um, from my conversations with our partner, um, that's enough to maintain that genetic diversity. But if that drops, we could eventually lose mule deer from the McDowell Mountains. Understood, thank you very much. And, and off of that too, you did mention the mule deer telemetry uh, work might be done in another eight to 10 years. That for me, that feels like a long time and we could <laughs> be losing some critical data and perhaps missing an opportunity. Is that the preferred length of time or is that a realistic uh, time frame due to budget. <laughs> so it, it, that's kind of a multi-part answer, but every 10 years is an acceptable time frame. Budget is definitely a huge part of that. But again, because some of these species are a bit longer lived um, in generational time, every 10 years is suitable to detect those changes. If we could do it every year, that'd be awesome. But honestly, that could also have some influence on the population as well, just because of us actually being out of them. Sure, sure. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, Commissioner Lips, your hand was up. Hello, this is Commissioner Lips. Um, because of, uh, speaking of development that you were mentioning before, the, since that area is being very heavily developed now, uh, that area, you know, by Rio Ver the Rio Verde Road, um, is there any thought as to doing some types of educational outreach with whoever those new residents are to uh, make them better neighbors, perhaps? Uh, I mean, is there anybody who's actually kind of keeping an eye on that area as far as 
um, you know, whether animals are being injured or killed or whatever once those homes go in. Commissioner or Chairman Dodd, Commissioner Lips, another wonderful question. I love all of you. I just have to say that your questions are <laughs> so fantastic. We love you too. <laughs> I mean, education is always a key part to what we do and targeted education, especially in situations like this are really important. And I have tons of ideas on how we can go about doing this. And there's actually a lot of partner groups that we could draw from who do this sort of work as well. I think reaching out to neighbors, um, neighborhoods, communities, HOAs, individuals, all of that is a really important aspect of this, not just within that corridor area, but all throughout um, surrounding preserve areas. I don't know if that answered your question or not. Uh, it may be a it may be a question for the city also. Uh, you know, besides you, I just thought that it might be a good idea to develop some of these types of uh, resources so there are less problems with the new neighbors. And thank you, Tiffany. Thank you. And uh, this is Croy, um, Commissioner Lips. Uh, that's. There isn't anything I, I I wouldn't say that's singularly targeted at the the preserve and wildlife per se, but through um, uh, long established uh, standards for uh, planning with regards to how developments are done, um, many of the things that we've seen game and fish request as far as some of the open space and some of the fencing are picked up. And, and you know, yeah, downlighting. So we have many things, but but could there be a re-review of that? Uh, obviously, uh, there's always opportunity, I'm sure, for um, uh, you know picking up on some things. To so the issue of of communication um, with neighbors, I think that's um, an opportunity that um, I'm, I, is that may actually have a relationship in my next presentation on wildland fire and talking about firewise community and opportunities may be in pairing up with the conservancy and stewards being part of the outreach. And, and I think an opportunity is then there for um, some of the wildlife and the habitat um, education to occur in that framing as well. So I think there's some things that you're touching on that are well worth further discussion as we go forward here. Yes, thank you, Commissioner Lips. Um, any other uh, quick questions or comments uh, from commissioners? Uh, if not, we will. Yes, oh. uh, Commissioner Hackbarth here. Yes, sir. Um, a question for the city. If there is any way to uh, the developers that are working now or planning now, is there any way to get them to get their natural area and open spaces uh, aligned some way in which uh, corridors are maintained. That's something that the city can approach them when the zoning goes in or before when they start planning. I, um, you know, much of that work has already been done. Uh, this is Corey again, and uh, a good question, I think. Uh, open space almost always has been, been encouraged along major wash corridors. And so in that regards, um, uh, Tiffany can correct me if I, I err here, not being the uh, biology expert, but the, uh, much of the wildlife will move along those, those corridors. But we haven't, of course, had any uh, singularly identified uh, corridors that are wildlife habitat corridors themselves. And so no, I can't say it's been uh, encouraged because of knowledge of wildlife, but it has been encouraged because of location of significant uh, geological features, be it hills, hilltops, and wash corridors um, are, are typically the things that open space has been. But as we continue to get this uh, level of information, we can share that. The challenge will be that much of the, the preserve edge has already been developed and um, uh, majority of that area uh, just south of the gooseneck has already been planned. Uh, it may not quite be developed, but uh, there, there are 
the, many of the plats have already been approved. But we're happy to continue to work on educating. Uh, and I, I think the area that we will be able to include some of this would be uh, any of the lands in the recommended study boundary that are state lands that we don't acquire, we would have knowledge on some of that and be able to uh, further that along. Thank you. Okay, any, any other quick questions? Uh, if not, we will move on to Wildland. Yep, so Scott's gonna uh, pull up uh, the screen here. And I'll, I'll just go ahead and start. Again, this is uh, related to the um, uh, our policy review ongoing effort. And this is a little bit of an update um, from where we uh, presented some earlier this year when we were talking about um, what we needed to be doing uh, as we were facing uh, the beginning of the wildland fire season. And um, you can go to the next one, Scott. So th this graphic, um, of course, shows the northern area. Uh, it highlights uh, such things. The red are Jeep roads. The blue, the big blue, are the uh, sandy wash corridors. Um, and of course, then you've got the all the red dots uh, are the roofed structures. And this is a, a graphic. And we were just meeting with our fire department today, um, and we're talking about updating master plans. Uh, for uh, wildland fire protection and we'll review these items of maintenance and costs, be they yearly or one time, and then are there policy issues we need to address and firewise. So the next slide um, just identifies uh, some of these strategic things that we'll, we'll work on on a much closer level on the graphic previous, but this is a nice overview that shows you where um, we have roads that are adjacent to the preserve uh, dirt roads in the preserve or uh, bisecting the preserve. Um, and then of course our trailheads, those are our major structures, not to say that trails and other things uh, don't have influence and impact as well. And um, as I mentioned, we, um, our fire department is actually um, working and we hope to have an individual who has a great deal of experience with the Tonto National Forest and desert uh, wild uh, land um, protection and firefighting experience um, and an opportunity in the next several months uh, to really um, proceed with some uh, details that will go far beyond what we have here. And so that's something that we intend to have available um, uh, to some draft level by the time we are meeting again uh, in the uh, first part of 2021. Um, so we are going to be updating these elements that we have here. Um, and then the next slide, um, we uh, comes back to this issue then of where should we be strategically prioritizing our efforts and whether those are yearly efforts of thinning, um, we, we do our trailheads, we do uh, many of the road right of ways. Um, but as we look at our power line corridors and other things, are there additional efforts that should be going on? Uh, are there additional signage efforts that we're working with a fire department right now on improving and expanding uh, the citywide uh, fire sensitivity level uh, throughout the year? And of course, education, as I mentioned before. The other thing is, are there one time uh, improvements or maybe things that need to happen every five years or 10 years. Uh, the effort that we did this past uh, spring with the Tonto National Forest uh, crew that did the clearing along Pima Road north of Dynamite uh, that removed about 70% of the fuel load in that area uh, and the importance of that. And so these again are elements that we'll bring back and, and to this policy effort then we, we update the master plan, we update the strategic uh, priorities, and then we identify the costs of these things. So what are our yearly costs projected to be? What are our one-time costs or every five-year costs? Um, so those are all things that we will be developing. And as I said, uh, we're very excited to have uh, this individual from the Tonto National Forest with a great deal of desert experience. Uh, and we'll be bringing back uh, quite a bit of information for you um, in that February, March timeframe. Uh, the next slide um, just 
uh, and I'm not going to go into this in any great detail today, but knowing that we have uh, an environmentally sensitive lands ordinance uh, that does certain things to protect and doesn't necessarily encourage wildland fire um, uh, clearing, uh, our own preserve ordinance, we may need to look at and address that. And as we've chatted before, there's some language in the Prop 420 that might be interpreted as being a bit too restrictive for wildland fire improvement. Um, and so those are all things that we wanna make sure that we consider in this policy discussion. So again, we'll bring those back in highlights. And then this slide speaks to the firewise communities. And as I was just chatting before uh, about the opportunity for communication, um, and we've had presentations on firewise before, uh, we're, we're looking to make the preserve a firewise uh, element, but equally, or maybe more importantly, all of the surrounding neighborhoods, the subdivisions, the master plan communities, and several already are, but there's an opportunity for a lot more. And since we're all worried about, uh, there's not much we can do about mother nature throwing a lightning bolt at us, but um, the things we worry about streets and dragging chains and people throwing out cigarette butts, uh, and be that in our trailhead parking lots or whatever, but also all these neighborhoods that back up to the preserve. And if someone is has a charcoal uh, uh, grill going and they throw the, the coals over the fence or whatever that is, um, those are things that we want to be paying attention to. And we um, are, are, will be uh, visiting with uh, Justin and Jackie uh, about some, uh, I think, creative opportunities to merge fire staff preserve staff and stewards in opportunities of outreach to our neighboring uh, communities. And we'll be pursuing that. We'll be pursuing grant funding opportunities for some of these things. And we'll be identifying with these resources with the Tonto National Forest and others. Are there other opportunities that we've yet to identify or think about and get those? So that's all part of discussions that just happened this afternoon. Uh, and we'll have more detail on that in the next couple of months. Um, and then just coming back. So this is just that summary slide of the things that we're going to be working on. And we'll be bringing that all back to you. Um, and with that, I'm happy to take any questions that you might have on this subject. Uh, Mr. Chair, this is Commissioner McKeegan. I have a question. Yes, sir. Go ahead. Croy, can you give us... Um, sort of a refresher on what we did along 136th Street for the fire mitigation? Uh, specifically this past year, you're speaking north of uh, Dynamite? North of Dynamite. Uh, a while back, we had done a um, sort of a oh. site visit, looked at some options out there. And can you tell us what's going on out there since then? Right. Um, so uh, over the last couple of years, we have um, done uh, clearing uh, through our uh, street maintenance um, where we go in and I will say about an average of 15 to 20 feet um, of the fine fuels and moderate fuels have been cleared uh, each year and that you know with the rainfall with the grasses with the um, with the wildflowers uh, that uh, our fire department will lovingly call fuel load um, we uh, remove that as needed, um, but it is not as extensive as what we did on, on Pima Road this past year, um, and it may well be a discussion we need to have. And so then the, the other element that you just spoke of, we did that test when we started or were doing the uh, improvements a year and a half ago at Granite of some different ways of maybe treating uh, that uh, right of way or back of curb. And um, th we, we've been that's, that will be an effort that we will bring in more detail um, with this overall master plan strategy. Uh, we want to address that not just for 136, uh, but really all of our road edges, uh, uh, um, Stagecoach to the north, uh, the, the Rio Verde uh, and uh, Pima and 128th Street going through the preserved gooseneck area. All of those uh, are areas that will be, be we will be bringing back to you and addressing some of those concepts. Awesome, thank you. Any other questions or comments from commissioners? 
Okay, if not, we will move along on our agenda to policy review process update. <laughs> This is Commissioner Winston. I'm sorry, my I keep losing my Bluetooth. So just about the time I want to speak, my audio goes out. Anyway, one question for you, please, Croy. Yes. Yes. Uh, number one, thank you so much for bringing the 420 ordinance uh, to your list because I think that's critical that we look at that. Uh, but my question is, um, in the Southern Preserve communities, and I, I look at our fires that we've had in our state and of course, California, but 30,000 acres can go pretty quickly and we are very disjointed between the Southern and the Northern, which we just spoke about earlier with uh, Tiffany. But um, we've been successful to the best of my knowledge with the preserve communities or the communities adjacent to the preserve in the Southern area as far as being fire safe. I'm hoping that we could replicate that in the North because we are getting a large population up there and we're very um, concentrated on our trails and our human activity up in the northern part. So I would hope that whatever we've done in the southern part to keep it at this point human safe, that we would replicate that in the northern part. Uh, we, we intend to uh, uh, continue the efforts to the north and redouble our efforts to the south just to ensure that we, um, I, I don't think any of us are wanting to ever really feel absolutely comfortable that we have it all nailed down. Uh, yes. Fire just can come from so many different sources and uh, we, we want to stay very aggressive in that. And, and that's a great thing about our relationship with the fire department. They're um, also on board with that. And like I said, this commitment to bring in resources uh, with experience from uh, the Sonoran Desert in the Tonto National Forest, we think is going to be just another great piece of of knowledge and education to add uh, to our, our master plan. Um, and so we're looking forward to doing that in the next few months. Terrific, thank you so much for all your efforts. You are welcome. All right, okay. Uh, let's move along to item 5B. Yep. So, I, you know, we had this discussion um, end of last year and beginning of this year, and we thought we were going to get all fired up and, and charged through all these items that we're going through now back in the spring. And I forget what happened in March that slowed us down, but um, we're gonna bring our focus back to this. Uh, we chatted about it once before. The goal is, and we're gonna retool this language uh, or at least the formatting of it. Our goal is to make it a web page uh, that will allow people to follow each of these policy items that we've been talking about. Uh, taking the PowerPoints, um, uh, the excellent ones that Tiffany has been presenting, making those available in a single point. You don't have to go looking to the Preserve Commission meetings to find them, uh, but rather have those in, in a manner and, and giving people a way of, of tracking this and following this. And so, uh, the, you know, the next slide just summarizes uh, what you're probably tired of seeing from us is the, the key policy elements that we're reviewing. Uh, the next slide shows the back page that emphasize that, you know, your direction is that you, the existing preserve, the purpose and the management objectives, and assuring that long-term sustainability of the preserve for the next 25 years is our focus on this effort. And so we'll take those elements, we'll build on that. And then this next slide is, is the time frame that, that we're working through. And we're going to really get into it here in the spring. Uh, bringing back a lot of the things that we've just now been through over the past three or four months and bringing back and starting to get into the costs and adding all of those up, not just in each one of those seven uh, areas, but adding them all up. And are they yearly costs? Are they one-time costs? Uh, we'll bring forward some spreadsheets that will keep track of this. And, and you guys are going to be able to fill in the blanks uh, on that based upon the information presented and based upon, and there may be ranges that we wanna go with. So that, I just wanted to remind us that this is kind of the next phase that we're gonna start developing. We'll have the web page, we'll improve the communications so that people can track that. And we're obviously cautiously optimistic that there'll be opportunities for meetings face-to-face -face and for the public to join us. Uh, and so that maybe we can enhance some of the feedback and other things that are coming and then uh, this last slide just reiterates, and we'll be talking about it under upcoming agendas, 
that what we'll be looking to do in this spring time frame is um, if, if needed in January, a special meeting, we'd send out uh, a, a poll as we typically do to see availability, but we're looking at both regular and special meeting opportunities in all the months of February through June. And our target will be getting to some type of city council work study session. And I simply put May, June, because that's the likely time frame I think we could get in. Uh, and we'll refine that uh, as we get a little closer to that time period. And I think we've already talked about a possible tour, maybe more than one tour, uh, the land acquisition interest, several of you expressed interest, and we'll, we'll get a poll out on that going out and looking at the areas south of Legend Trail uh, in the state lands and doing some things like that. So I just wanted to run through this, remind everybody that uh, even with the holidays coming in a little bit of a break, uh, we're not going to stop working on this, and this is kind of the, the goal that we have coming forward. So, Mr. Chairman, that, that uh, completes my presentation on this. I'm happy to answer any questions that you all may have. Okay. Uh, any questions for Croy or any final uh, commissioner comments or questions? Uh, Mr. Chair, this is Commissioner Keegan. I just have a comment. Um, since I won't get to comment on this again. Um, thanks for going over that stuff, Corey. I mean, the, I guess my thought is it, it feels like a, it, it's refreshing to see the culmination um, before the commission on all these issues. There's been a lot of groundwork laid going back to um, three plus years ago between um, Chairman Hytel and Chairman Frost developing the the idea of a perpetual fund or, or care of the preserve, uh, moving into uh, the discussions we had with the, the treasurer's office, uh, understanding how the budget works with the preserve onto the stuff that we had tonight, uh, the continuing view of the, the tax credits. And, and some of this stuff has certainly been tedious, um, but I think the groundwork has been laid for the commission to make some some really important and meaningful decisions over the next six to 18 months. Um, and so it, it, it's, it, it can be easy to overlook some of these items, but they really are just critically important. And uh, I'm, I'm looking forward to, uh, to seeing what comes of them. So once again, thank you for your work on that. All right, thanks Commissioner McKeegan. Uh, any other questions or comments? Yeah, I'll just, comment that we, we won't be letting uh, Commissioner McKeegan off the hook just as his time expires. We are going to keep him involved in the staff uh, working team and uh, he has graciously uh, accepted or acknowledged or let his arm be twisted uh, to stay involved. So uh, you'll probably still hear from him as we'll, we'll probably utilize him in some of our presentations in the future uh, to help continue some of the knowledge and dialogue uh, from those years past. Great. Yes. Any other questions, comments? If not, is there a, is there a motion to adjourn? Oh, no, I want you guys to real quick. quick. I'm sorry. I left Scott. I have one uh, very brief staff report item for you tonight. Uh, this is the southern part of the preserve. You can see the Lost Dog Wash Trail head there at the bottom of the screen. Uh, the Lost Dog Wash Trail heading out, sunrise over here to the right. Uh, so the highlighted yellow is the old Jeep trail. And our trail named the old Jeep trail is just that. It's an old Jeep trail. Uh, it's been there for many, many decades. Uh, there's some sections of it that are in pretty rough condition. As you can see here from a couple representative photographs, uh, there's a lot of erosion happening on parts of it. And um, our city preserve staff working with uh, the CNM crew from the Conservancy have tried. You can see some of the efforts here to try to push the water off to the right at the bottom of the screen. Uh, but part of the problem we have with this is it's so rocky out there. The soil is so hard uh, and there's some really significant erosion issues. Uh, that we're going to be having uh, Doug Hansen from Cuddy Mountain Trail Company, who many of you probably know from work that he's done, uh, particularly in the northern area of the preserve, 
we're going to have Doug come in over the next several weeks uh, and try to help us uh, get the water draining off of this, uh, some of these segments of the old Jeep trail a little bit better than they have been in the past. So just wanted to give you a quick heads up about that. Uh, I'd be happy to answer any questions you might have, or we can slide right on to item number seven. Uh, next, next slide is a repeat of the one I had before. It just shows uh, that upcoming schedule. Uh, we will uh, work with the chair and vice chair if there's uh, deemed a need for a, a, a mid to late January meeting. Uh, we'll get a poll out. Otherwise, February 4th is certainly uh, on our schedule and um, we'll be uh, keeping you updated uh, with that. Um, and I will say as we're coming to the conclusion here, we do uh, we will have a nice parting gift for uh, Commissioner McKeegan and his six years of support. And uh, on behalf of staff, uh, we are very uh, uh, thankful for his uh, involvement and participation. And as I said uh, previously, we're not letting him off the hook. We're going to uh, keep him involved. Uh, so you will hear from him in the future. With that, Mr. Chair, I'm, I'm done. Yes, we're, we're pleased that we have at least a part-timer now. <laughs> Anyway, um, no further uh, questions or comments. We'll now. Now, commissioner comments, if you have any of those. Yes, that's what we're calling for. There you go. Any commissioner comments or questions? Uh, this is Commissioner McKeegan. I'll keep it really brief. That uh, Thanks to all of you. Um, the, the best part of this has been the people. And um, it's been a lot of fun. And with that, I would, uh, there are no other com commissioner comments. I'll move to adjourn. This, this is Commissioner Weinstrom, just one comment. Jace, you can't get off that easily. It has been a pleasure working with you, and I'm delighted to know that you will stay on as a part-timer with us. <laughs> Thank you. All right. Anyone else? So once again, you got, a motion. Got, a motion. got a motion. Commissioner Lips. Are you there? We can't hear you, Marsha. I know I had to unmute. This is. There you are. I'd like to second the motion to adjourn, but at the same time, I would like to uh, say, Jace, we love you, and we're glad that you're going to stick around a little bit. Thank you. Okay, uh, let's do a quick roll call. Roll call on adjournment. Uh, Commissioner Dodd votes yes. Commissioner Winstrom. We'll assume that's a yes. Commissioner Hagbar. I vote yes. Commissioner LaPat Pulasco. LaPat Pulasco votes yes. Commissioner Lips. Lips votes yes. Commissioner McKeegan. Yes. Commissioner Parker. Yes. Okay. We are, in fact, adjourned. Thank you all for your participation tonight. Uh, thank you, Tiffany, if you're still there. Uh, for the great information as well. Otherwise, we will see you guys next month.